Hey guys, welcome back to this, the definitive series on the HK Pilot 2.7 Mega. My name is Matt, and today we're gonna talk about APM Rovers. Broken this down into four steps for you. I'm gonna tell you guys what it is that we need. I'll take you through the initial setup and calibration of the board. We'll go through installing those components onto the Rover itself, and then we'll go through making that Rover work. Pretty straightforward. I'll list all this stuff out for you. We'll get out playing with this thing. It is a whole lot of fun. Let's go. Okay guys, part one, what do we need to make a rover? Well, to start with, we're gonna need the HK Pilot 2.7 Master Set. I went over all of the components that are included in that set in episode one, the intro for this series, so please do go check that out if you're curious about what's gonna come in the box. We're not gonna use all of the components for the rover build. We are gonna use what I've got on the table in front of me here. That is the HK Pilot main board. This is the brains and heart of the system. Obviously the most important component. We're also gonna be using this, which is the power module. This connects between your battery and the power, or the, uh, sorry, the control board, and gives you out uh, indication of sort of amp draw, voltage, things like that, lets you know what's going on with the vehicle and how much battery life you have left. We're going to use this handy thing here. This is a separate GPS, or sorry, this is a GPS unit with a separate digital compass. You'll plug this unit in, this will give you the GPS and the separate digital compass gives you very accurate heading readings. Why would you use an external compass and not the compass that is already on your board? Well, that is pretty simple. This thing gets mounted way up on the top of this guy, out of the way of everything else. It keeps your compass signal clear and free of interference. The other part that we're gonna use on the rover, the most important part really, are these little guys. This is the transceiver set. You have one, as you can see, the USB cable on it. This connects to your PC or your tablet. And you have one with this little five pin cable on it. This connects directly the HK Pilot Mega Board. These little guys let you send and receive information, navigation, etc., to and from the vehicle, from your phone, tablet, or PC. It really unlocks the magic in the whole thing. Uh, other parts you're gonna need, well, clearly you're gonna need a radio to drive the thing. For APM, you need a minimum of six channels with at least one two-position switch. So you're gonna need either one of our newer sort of V2 orange T6 radios, or something like my trusty Tyrannus, or even better yet, our 9XR or 9XR Pro, which are also excellent radios, along with an orange module and receiver. Additionally, to finish out a rover the way I've done this one here, you're gonna need some FPV gear, because it's a whole lot more fun to drive this thing, trust me, through its own perspective. Uh, on this unit, I'm using a Fat Shark 250 milliwatt transmitter with a special cable that lets it run directly to the GoPro and I'm also rocking my attitude goggles with this circular polarized antenna set. The circular polarized antennas make a pretty big difference for a rover as well because anytime you're doing FPV near the ground, transmission strength and uh, sort of interference and stuff are a big deal. You don't get to go as far as you do in the air, so the better your antenna and the better your transmitter, the better the whole experience. So what are we gonna use? What's coming up? How are we gonna do this? Pretty straightforward. The first things first, we need to update the firmware on this board make a few changes and get it installed in that case so we can put it onto the vehicle. Uh, first thing you want to do is go here to this permanent link and download the latest version of Mission Planner, which is the PC slash Mac slash Linux uh, desktop based software that you're going to use to communicate with this board. Download the latest version of Mission Planner and use the included USB mini B cable that came with your master set to connect this board to the PC. Uh, it's pretty important that you download and install Mission Planner and the drivers that come with Mission Planner before you plug this thing in so you don't confuse Windows. When you first plug it in, it's going to light up and blink at you, do some interesting stuff. That's all normal. That means the board's working as it should. When this board ships to you, it usually has the multi-copter firmware installed on it. We're not running a multi-copter, usually Quad X. In this case, we're going to set this thing up for a rover. When you first open up your Mission Planner software, it's gonna you know, go through the Windows install and stuff, get it all dialed in, whether it's Windows, Mac, what have you, uh, and open up the software. When it opens up, it's gonna come up on a screen that says Flight Data. That's the initial screen. You should see kind of a map of the world and some other information, it's pretty neat. Uh, you're gonna go over and click on Initial Setup. When you click on that tab, the software will automatically download the latest version of firmware. You'll still get a little progress bar. When that's finished, you'll see a pictures of a bunch of different kinds of vehicle. In this case, in the upper left, you're gonna choose Arju Rover. This is version 2.47 at the time of this recording. If it's been updated since then, congratulations. Click on Arju Rover 2.47, and it will sit here and confirm for you. Are you sure you want to upload that? Yes, yes, I'm sure. 
click on that and follow along on the Magic Progress bar. Just sit there and wait, it will go through, it will download the latest version, verify that version, upload it onto the board, and then verify the upload. When all of those things are done, you will get a green progress bar indicating that they're done. We can move on with the next step on this board. After you've installed the firmware, you want to go ahead and disconnect this thing from the PC. That's the only bit of software or the only bit of Mission Planner that we're going to do while physically connected via USB. There is a lot more to do in Mission Planner, but we'll do that via the little transceiver guys with a wireless connection, which is very, very cool in just a minute. But before we get there, we got to get this thing physically assembled. Now, the first thing you want to do is pull off a couple of jumpers on this board. There's one here that says EX Mag, that's for external magnetic compass or external magnetometer, in this case, the compass in the GPS. You gotta pull that jumper off, and that allows the board to use the external compass instead of the one that's built in. Now, there's one other jumper you want to be aware of in this case. Now, because this is a skid steer vehicle, and I don't have any other servos or anything else that's running through this board, I can leave this jumper in place. If you're gonna run this vehicle with a traditional car where you have like a high power steering servo that's running off of the UBEC from your ESC, you wanna remove this jumper as well. That prevents the power module of APM from trying to provide the power for your servos. Instead, it makes the, the power for your servo come only from the ESC. So if you're gonna run high power servos, whether it's a plane or rover or whatever, make sure you remove that power jumper as well. Next thing we're gonna do is physically install everything onto the rover itself. Begin by installing your APM 2.7 board into the case that came with the master set. It's a pretty cool little plastic fitted case, it snaps together fairly straightforward and has four screws that get installed on the bottom. That makes it very convenient to mount this unit itself on the vehicle using either Velcro or double-sided tape. I'm gonna go over to the rover that I've already assembled. I'll take you through this and show you where everything is installed. Guys, I clear off the table, got the rover here front and center. I'm gonna show you guys how to set this thing up, plug everything in and get it going. First things first, this is a four x four Wild Thumper robot chassis. This guy uses a pair of brushed Hobby King ESCs. There's a motor in each wheel with a 75 to one reduction. It is ridiculously slow, but also very, very fun. and makes this setup pretty easy because it doesn't get away from you while we're trying to learn how to make APM work. So first thing you're gonna do, now that you've got this thing mounted in its case, is mount the case on the rover. You wanna use either some Velcro or some double-sided tape, something that's gonna give some vibration uh, isolation to this unit from what it's mounted on. Everything that you're gonna plug in is pretty straightforward because for the most part, all of the connectors only fit where they're supposed to go, either because of the number of pins or the orientation of the little tabs on the connectors. It's pretty hard to plug anything in incorrectly. Power module goes here to PM or power module on the unit. The transceiver module goes here to this. It's probably the only unlabeled connector, but like I said, it only has the correct number of pins to fit in. That's where the transceiver module plugs in. And then right up here at the front is the GPS and the compass connector on the side. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that guy in there. The other connections that you need to make are from the receiver to the APM unit and from the APM unit to the vehicle. On the output side, basically you just have one and three. One is steering and three is throttle on a conventional vehicle or on a skid steer vehicle like this one. One is left and three is right on the output side. On the input side, it's a little bit stranger in the sense that you're going to use four channels total. On the receiver side, you're using one, two, five, and six. And then on the input side, on the APM unit, you're using one, three, seven, and eight. What am I talking about? Well, just like on a regular car, uh, which would be channels one and two, here on the receiver, one is steering, two is throttle, or in this case, one is my left track, two is my right track. So you plug one to one and two to three. That gets the track set up. Then you're gonna set up a pair of switches so that you can change modes or execute functions here on the APM. That's gonna be channels five and six on your receiver, and it's gonna be channels seven and eight on the inputs of the APM. Even stranger than that, you're going to take the output from channel six on your receiver and run that to channel eight on the input of the APM, and you're gonna take channel five from your receiver and you run that to channel seven on the, on the uh, APM input. Why are you doing that? Well, it's so that you can have channel five on your receiver on a three-way switch on your radio, so you have three separate settings, and channel six on the receiver should be on a momentary switch so you can tell it to do something like hitting enter. Uh, in this case, you're gonna set up the thing so that you have 
manual mode, learning mode, and auto mode on your radio with a three position switch. And in each of those modes, you'll use the other switch like an enter key to tell the unit to do something. Don't worry, I'll go into a bit more detail about what that's all about. For now, what you need to know is how to make those connections correctly. If you want a visual representation of this, or if you want a little guide to follow on that's pretty handy, you can go to uh, rover.argupilot.com. That will take you to a site set up by the open source guys that developed this board with some specific instructions on making this connection, these connections. Now, that's it for physical connections on the APM and receiver side to get the rover up and running. You'll notice there are a few other wires hanging out of this thing. That's related to this FPV system on the front. Now, this is its own standalone thing. Without this entire FPV system, this rover would still function as intended. If you want some more details on the super simple FPV system that's rocking out on this thing, check out our FPV 123 series, episode one. That will include this series as well as a couple other simple FPV systems if you want to get that kind of thing up and running. To make the connections from the receiver to the APM board, use these included mail-to-mail -mail servo leads that come in the master set. One final note on the assembly of the vehicle itself. When you're orienting all of this stuff, be sure to orient the GPS facing forward as well. It does have an arrow on the top to indicate what direction that should be. Now that we've got all the physical components installed on the rover, next thing we have to do is calibrate the board and set everything up using Mission Planner on the PC. Now it is possible to connect the board directly to the computer using that included USB Mini B cable, but it's a lot easier to do these next steps if you're not tethered to the computer. That's where these transceiver modules come in the first time here in the setup. Uh, what is a transceiver? That means each of these units can both send and receive. So you don't have a separate unit now that goes with the computer and one that stays with the module. They're more or less interchangeable. You'll notice on the back side they have both connectors. One is the multi-pin cable that goes to the APM unit and the other is a USB mini B connector. We're going to go ahead and plug one of these guys into the PC using that same USB cable. It comes with the kit. And the other unit is mounted on our rover. We're gonna go ahead and plug this rover in to turn it on. Now, conveniently enough, because this is car based, my ESCs do have a switch which I've mounted here on the front of the rover. I'm gonna leave that switch off so I'm not actually powering the motors on this unit and just go ahead and plug it in. Occasionally you get some issues with APM where the rover decides to try and run on its own or something like that because you haven't got everything fully calibrated and set up yet. So to be as safe as possible, we don't want to turn the motors on. If you don't have a switch on your vehicle, disconnect the output that goes to the motor on the APM unit so that you don't get an accidental runaway. Now that you've got your transceivers, one, one connected to the PC with the mini USB cable, and the other connected to the APM, both powered up, you will see this little red LED in the transceiver itself just flashing like mad. That flat, fast flash means these two units are communicating with one another. So we're gonna go over to the PC, open up Mission Planner. If you look in the upper right corner of the screen, you will see a COM port, a data rate, and a connect button. If you're not sure which COM port you're in, you can click on auto, or in this case, I know that my unit is connected to COM port 10. If you come over here to the data rate, the default for Mission Planner is 115.2 or 115,200 baud. We need to change that over to 57.6 or 57,600 baud and then you can click connect. When it starts connecting, your little box that pops up says connecting Mavlink. A lot of information goes on. That is the Mission Planner software sharing parameters and information back and forth between the APM board and the computer via Mavlink. As soon as that's done, it will say it's done and it will bounce you over to the main Mission Planner flight data screen. You probably won't see anything just yet or if you do, you'll get some really weird numbers because we haven't calibrated this unit or done any of that. That's where we're headed next. We're going to go through, we're going to set up the equipment, we're going to calibrate it, we're going to tell this unit what different pieces are plugged in where. All of that is done here via the initial setup tab in Mission Planner. You click on that guy and you'll see a list to the left. There's install firmware and wizard. You can skip both of those. We've already done that step. That's how we got this firmware installed on the board in the first place. You're going to click on this mandatory hardware list and expand it and you'll find that the top item is called compass. Click on compass and that'll bring up a screen here to the right. <clears throat> you will notice a couple of radio buttons next to a little picture of a PCB board of sorts. You want to make sure that enable is turned on. That enables the compass in general and that auto declination is set. That will allow this thing to use the GPS coordinates to decide the compass declination settings. You don't have to do that manually. 
Back in the day, you used to have to look it up on a chart and set it. You'll notice a box that says orientation. You have some options in there, Pixhawk, APM with onboard compass or APM with external compass. In our case, you wanna click APM with external compass because we are using an external compass and GPS module plugged into the unit. From there, you wanna go ahead and click live calibration. That's gonna let us calibrate the compass and get this thing knowing exactly what direction it's facing. This is a really important step. The better you do this calibration, the more thorough this is, the more accurately this thing tracks waypoints, the better it compares to the GPS information, the better it works in general. Click on the live calibration button, and you will see a little radio box pops up that says, please click OK and move the APM around on all axes. What they're asking you to do here, we'll click OK. You'll see this box brings up a little graphic representation. What they're asking you to do is spin this vehicle around on all of its various axes of motion, and that will start to draw and fill in spots on this graph. You can see little boxes appearing next to me here as I do this. And that's gonna fill in slowly as you go. And the idea here is to spin this thing around quite a bit on all these various axes. And you can kind of go nuts and just start spinning it. Uh, and this will calibrate the compass as thoroughly as possible, mark a whole lot of points in 3D space, and make this thing more accurate. Now, as you go through this process and fill in the globe, it's kind of fun actually. It's like its own little Tetris game. Get it all filled in as best you can. See a little thing that pops up, it says new mag offsets, kind of confirming that it's calibrated itself. It says they've been saved for you. Click OK. If you want to confirm that the calibration has worked well, go back to the flight data screen. Check up here on the upper left, if you see GPS 3D fix, then you've got a good 3D position in hold by the GPS. It's comparing that data to the data from the compass you look on the screen over here, the little icon that represents your rover in the middle of the screen should be pretty stationary. If it's drifting around a whole lot or it's moving all over the screen, then your calibration isn't very accurate, isn't very good, you need to go back and repeat that. If the vehicle's relatively stationary, if it doesn't appear to be drifting much, then you've done a good job with the calibration and we can move on to the next step. The next thing we're gonna do is radio calibration. If you click on the radio calibration menu option below compass here at Mission Planner, you'll see a screen pop up on the right that gives you some bars that represent what the APM is seeing as a signal coming from your receiver. At this point, you wanna turn your radio on. Again, make sure that the APM unit, the motors are deactivated one way or another so that this thing can't get away while you're setting this up. You are gonna be moving and working with the sticks on your radio. You wanna make sure that nothing happens with the vehicle while you're doing that. So, so with your radio on, looking at this radio calibration screen, you wanna confirm the various functions are doing what you want. In this case, because it's a rover, it's pretty simple. I just have forward and backward, left and right, and my two switches that control the various functions on the rover. Now, you just wanna basically move your stick to the left and confirm that the bar on the screen does the same thing. When you push to the left, the green bar should move to the left. When you push to the right, the green bar should move to the right. So you can see that's going the way it should. Same with the throttle, forward and backward on the throttle should produce green bar up, green bar down on the screen. With the switches, you'll find that the switch on the radio corresponds directly to the input number on the APM. So here we have radio seven and radio eight on screen, that's input seven and eight here on the APM unit. So when you flip the switch here, that switch is mapped to radio eight, this plug eight, and you should see it, the green bar increase. Same over here, when we hit this momentary switch, that's connected to radio seven, and you should see radio seven flash there on the screen. Next thing you're gonna do is click here on the flight modes screen. You're gonna set flight mode one to auto, flight modes two through five to learning, and flight mode six to manual. That corresponds to our three position switch here on the radio where you see flight mode one is auto, flight mode in the middle there is learning, and flight mode at the bottom is manual. Now I'll get into what those do in a minute when we start driving this thing around, but for now, that's your three position switch. For now, we're gonna skip over the options that say fail safe and 3DR radio. We may come back to those here, but they're not all that important for the rover. Fail safe in particular is very important if you're using a plane or a multi-copter or something where if for some reason you were to suddenly lose radio contact, it's not gonna to go too crazy. With this guy, if you suddenly lose radio contact, you can just walk over and pick it up. Uh, and if you're doing autonomous operations where it's farther away from you, uh, then that isn't gonna matter so much because you're not in radio contact anyway. We'll get to all of that eventually. Basically, skip over failsafe, skip over 3DR radio. So go ahead and click on battery monitor. You'll get a few options here. You wanna click 
where it says monitor, change that to voltage and current. Sensor, you're gonna to change to other. And APM version, you're gonna to change to APM 2.5 plus with 3DR power module. Over here to the right of that, you will see uh, battery capacity. You wanna type in the total number of milliamp hour capacity of your battery, in this case, 12,000 milliamp hours. Type that in, we're good to go. You see below, it will say calibration and you should see some information about the voltage and other information. That should all be correct. You shouldn't need to change any of that. If you see below on the rest of the optional hardware menu here, there's some other choices, things like sonar, airspeed, optic flow, OSD, etc. We're not gonna be activating any of that stuff for right now. Uh, if you do have a sonar sensor, that's particularly cool. The sonar stuff allows this thing to avoid obstacles. Uh, I don't have any of those at the moment. If you wanted to add some, that would be cool. So that's it for what we need to do under the initial setup tab. Clearly there's a lot of options and other things you can do with APM that I'm not necessarily going into right away. Each of these episodes, I've got to try and keep a little bit concise. So the next thing we're going to do is go over to the config and tuning tab. You'll notice that the first option is flight modes. We just took care of that in our initial setup. You can take a look at them or perhaps reconfirm if you'd like that the uh, changes are operating the way that you want them to. And that's about it for that. Here in basic tuning. Now, basic tuning, this is where, if you're familiar with any other kinds of quads, if you've ever done any of this kind of flight controller stuff, this is where the PID settings are adjusted that would allow you to sort of fine tune various handling characteristics, including like your steering and your throttle and those sorts of things. Uh, I'm not making any changes here in the basic settings either. The defaults worked okay for this rover and actually tend to work okay for most rovers. If you do need to do some tuning, uh, we'll go into that in a bit at some point with some of the other episodes. We're definitely going to dig into that deeply with airplanes and quads. But don't worry, we will cover this stuff for right now for rovers. Everything's okay on default so we can run with what we've got. Coming on down next here to standard parameters. Now this is where we do need to make a change. Down in the standard parameter menu, you will find the settings for skid steer. This is a skid steer type vehicle. In other words, it steers like a bobcat or a tank. It doesn't have a steering servo that moves any wheels. It steers by either running the left side or the right side to kind of push you in the direction that you want to go. So here on the standard parameters list, you grab the little scroll bar. Most of this stuff is fine where it is. You don't need to make any changes. As you can see, there are a million different things here that you can set up with an APM, and we will eventually get into a lot of this as we go through various other vehicles. But for now, for the Rover, what we're concerned about is skid steer. You will find here a pair of settings. You'll find skid steering input and skid steering output. Now this was a little strange for me because I assumed I would be setting skid steering output so that the radio would be giving you a regular signal and the APM would be sending a skid steer signal to the unit. Turns out that's not the case. It actually is the skid steering input that I needed to select. So you go over here and you show from disabled to skid steering input. You say yes, uh, or you select that option and that's it. And then you're gonna go up here and you're gonna click right parameters and it will say parameters successfully saved. That's written all of that information and all those changes now to this vehicle. That's about it. You'll find here advanced parameters. We don't have to change any of those, thankfully, right now either for this vehicle. All of the defaults are okay. Within this screen, you'd find all kinds of things you can control, various declinations for offsetting the compass to make things better, uh, things to compensate for all sorts of minor issues, ways to fix compass problems, etc. There's a ton of information here. There's a ton of options, but the good news is generally you don't need many of them and you can leave all of that alone, especially right now with this vehicle. Now, one other thing, within the config tuning screen, you will also see an option here that says full parameters list. It's a pretty scary button. If you click on it, that's gonna give you uh, every option in sort of a text format that you can input on the APM board. Again, we don't need to change any of this stuff right now. Just wanna make you guys aware that there's another way to get to all of the information. All of the parameters and the settings that we just changed through the various wizards can also be done directly from this menu. And once you're very familiar with APM, you spent a lot of time with it, you may find it's quicker to go in and just run through this list and reset the things that you need to. Some people like to do it that way. I tend to stay away from this list because there's really no minimum or maximums or any other defined stuff. You can make changes that are really unintended and do some pretty strange things with the behavior of your vehicle. The last option you'll find here in the config and tuning tab is labeled planner. 
If you click on Planner, you will see a bunch of stuff here. This is kind of a neat screen. This lets you do some cool things with the Mission Planner software. We're not gonna get too deep into this just now yet either. This will be something we'll do a lot with the quad episode and the plane episode. But this lets you basically uh, overlay data from the aircraft onto the Mission Planner. So if you take the laptop with you to the field, and you're working directly from a PC like this, you can do cool stuff. You can put your uh, FPV video directly behind your instruments here on the screen. Makes you feel like a fighter pilot. Stuff's pretty neat. We'll get into that later. Again, just wanted to show you this. So you know what's coming later. That's pretty much it for the basic configuration we're going to do on this rover for now. We're ready to go ahead and test a couple of things. Uh, compare a few things here on the screen. Make sure everything's working like it should. And then we can take it out and try some of these cool waypoint navigation functions. Play with the radio a bit. First things first, though. Grab yourself a block of wood or something so you can lift the vehicle up off of its drive wheels the first time you turn it on. You want to make sure nothing strange is going to happen. Now we're ready to actually power up our motors for the first time and make sure that everything is working the way it should. So the vehicle is going the way it should and that everything we've set up corresponds radio and rover. First things first, go over to your config tuning screen, click on flight modes in the upper corner and make sure that your three position switch is in fact activating the flight modes as we intended in our setup. You want to leave this thing in the manual setting, as you can confirm here on the screen, and then you can move over here to flight data. Now we're ready to turn this thing on for the first time. Go ahead and flip the switch. You've got it in manual mode. It shouldn't do anything. If it didn't do anything, you've done it right. Now, you want to go ahead and use your radio and verify that your various controls, forward, backward, left, right, are doing what it is you intended them to do. In this case, they are, so we've got this set up correctly. If for some reason they're not, if forward is back or backward is forward or whatever, then you want to go back over here to initial setup to that radio configuration page and double check that all of your sticks and everything else are moving the way that they should. If that's the case, you're good to go. We're ready to go try this thing out. Let's do this. Guys, it's cold out here. I'm going to show you how this thing works, but I'm going to try to keep it a little bit brief. We're going to go over all of the ways to drive this thing with the radio right now. I'm not going to get into using Mission Planner and Waypoints from a phone to drive APM yet. We'll save that for another episode with the quads or the fixed wing. But right now, I'm just going to show you the easy steps, how to get this thing going, how to do autonomous driving from your radio. First things first, obviously, you're just going to drive like you normally would. That's in manual mode, and it just drives like a normal vehicle. That's with this three position switch all the way down. Now we're gonna do something kind of fun. We're gonna come back here to this cone. We're calling that cone home. We're gonna flip the switch to the middle position. That puts us in learning mode. Now what that does is now whenever I flip this guy, which is the momentary switch, it saves a waypoint, which I just accidentally did, but that's no big deal. It'll just double up on home. So here's our first spot. Now we're gonna go ahead and drive to our second waypoint. They have to be sufficiently far apart. There's our second waypoint. We'll click to save. Now, they have to be sufficiently far apart for the vehicle to actually get from point to point. If they're too close together and they overlap less than about 20 feet, uh, then the APM system won't work. Now we'll cruise along over here to waypoint number three. I guess that's technically waypoint number two, isn't it? <laughs> if you don't put one at home. So we'll close over to waypoint number two, flip our save switch again, and if we don't get lost, drive on back to home. Save that as a final waypoint. Now that it knows the waypoints, all I have to do is throw this switch from learning to auto, and this little guy should take off. There he goes. No hands. Forgive me, I probably should have built a faster rover. going there he goes so I should probably mention that uh, APM is really awesome and it works really really well however your results may vary there are a lot of parameters there are a lot of switches to be flipped there are a lot of things to do 
doesn't always work out exactly as you planned. I have been chasing this rover around this field for a while, having unexpected results. He's coming back. I'm very excited that it's working the way it should right now. He's almost here. Slow but cool, what can I say? And he's home. And that's it. Boom. So that was super cool. So that's learning mode again. Set the switch to learning, drive around. Everywhere you hit your momentary switch will save a waypoint. And it goes. And the one other thing that I want to show you guys on this real quick, I'm going to send this thing back out on its little journey. And about halfway around, I'm going to flip that momentary switch again. Whenever this thing is in auto mode and it's off doing its own thing, all you got to do is hit that switch and it'll automatically return to launch coming back to our home spot. Let's try that real quick. So if you wait until he's about halfway back like he is right now and you flip your return to home switch again, he should make a pretty abrupt beeline for us. As you can see, it works about as we had intended. Obviously, a faster rover might be a bit more fun, but this was a great way to cut my teeth on APM. Let's get it out of the cold. See you next time. So guys, that's gonna do it for APM Rover. As you can see, putting one of these together to run on the ground is not very difficult. And in fact, I highly recommend that as a place to begin with APM. If you wanna do this for a copter or for a plane or something else, starting out on the ground like this with fewer dimensions and fewer challenges is a really nice way to get used to the system start to understand it. I know it's helped me out quite a bit. Hope you enjoyed following along. Next thing we're going to do here is fixed wing. That should be a total blast. I know a lot of you are looking forward to that. That's going to be uh, Skywalker 1900, a big foamy. Should be a really awesome plane. Get that going very soon. Stay tuned.